Psalms chapter 26, a Psalm of David. Judge me, O Lord. Well, when you read what Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, judge yourself. For I have walked in my integrity. You can't say that today. Paul talks about judgment, and he says one of the things you are to judge when he's, especially he talks about the Lord's Supper, after saying there are sickly, there, there are those that sleep, those that are weak, is that you should judge yourselves, at least you fall in, in, you know, under the Father for the whipping post, for doing wrong. Uh, Jeremiah says, uh, judge me, but not with thine anger. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. That's a mouthful from an Old Testament scene. Slide there is backslidden, going backwards, doing a reverse repent. But walked in my integrity, we don't walk like that. We walk in Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the light. The reason why an Old Testament Jew can say that, and not a Christian, when you read Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it was laid out exactly what they were to do. Today, we walk by faith. We're told to go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. We're told to read the scriptures and study them. We're told to, to comfort the prayer. There are things we're told, but that's not for salvation. That's as a uh, that that should be your sole duty as a Christian. You ought to do it because for God so loved you. David and the Old Testament saints did it because that is what God told them. And still, you have a free will. You didn't have to obey the law, and then you don't have to. You didn't have to go to Abraham's bosom. Examine me, O Lord. Now that, that's proper for us. Examine me and prove me. Well, I don't know. There are some preachers out there who say, oh, you know, don't go asking for patience because with patience come tribulation. And it also says in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, I believe it is, that you know, if, if God doesn't whip you for, for being bad, you are a bastard. It says in James that, you know, we're to ask the Lord for wisdom, for understanding, for knowledge, not wavering. And that the trial of our faith is for our good. Trials will burn off the, 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 the least garbage, the junk in the metal. You know the best time we read about Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were in the fire furnace, yeah. But who was with them? Now, when King Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, you guys come out of that fire, they didn't wonder if they ever wanted to come out. But, Examine me, O oh Lord. That is something I, I've taught from Genesis. We are to ask God, say, God, what is in my life that you don't like? And many, much Christians will not dare to pray that because they know God will give an answer. And sometimes the answer may be in trials and tribulations to get you to do right. Hence the punishment from God, your Father. See, they don't want the answer. Because God will give them the answer. Well, I love that. I love to cling to that. Well, that's the case. And prove me. Try my reins. Again, that's your thoughts. And my heart. Check everything that, that works in my life, Lord. My motives and my thoughts. What guides me? What, what brings me to where I go? The reins. And heart is the motive. You do that. And you got to walk with the Lord.
if you obey the examination. Listen, sometimes when you go to a doctor's office for the examination, you know, he may do some things to you that's going to hurt. You know, when they stick that needle in there to get your blood to, to, to test it, it hurts. If you go to a doctor, I, I, some things, I, I guess, you if you got a, a bone out of a joint that they physically put that bone back, oh, that's going to hurt. But it hurts for the good. Yes, I say you should go to God and ask and ask God to examine you. Be things pure. And put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins to be clean. 1 John 1 9. Repent and get right before the judgment seat of Christ comes. For thy God's loving kindness is before my eyes. God loves you. God is kind. Why did God let this happen? Why did God do that? He didn't. Sin did it. Satan did it. The Holy God did it. Listen, you think God really wanted to kill the entire world except for eight people? You think God really wanted to destroy the entire city besides four people? You think God really pleased with that? When he says, you know what? He says, I'm long-suffering and I don't want anybody. Why will you die, O Israel? The rapture hasn't happened because God's long-suffering. There are people out there that need to be saved. And even if they don't get saved, they need to be told. See, always what God did this. God, they never talk about God's loving kindness. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And before my eyes, that's David speaking. Get off the negativity of God and get on what God does is right. And I have walked in thy truth. That's a mouthful. Four, five, six are really hard verses. And it's called separation. And it is a New Testament doctrine. I have not sat with vain persons. What do you do when you got a church house filled with them? What do you do when you got a whole family at a family reunion? Did Jesus sit with the vain persons? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm talking about the people that didn't want to have anything to do with him. That's vain. Vain means no good. Nothing. No, Jesus spent the time with those that would listen. Neither will I go in with this disassembly. Now, that's not somebody along the assembly line. You know, one people put things together and one people put them apart. Now, these are people who tear the church apart. These are people who tear families apart. These are people who tear Christians apart. King Saul was a disassembly between his son and, and David and between the kingdom that was given to David. King Saul knew exactly. And you go back and read the, 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 the Bible and find out that Saul knew that kingdom was David's. And what did he do? He disassembled. He tried to get rid of David. He tried to kill David. Disobedience to God. One of the things it says, six things God hates. Yes, yeah, seven is abomination. It's him that, that sows discord among the brethren. I will not go in with disassemblers. That implies there they are over there. You know they're over there. Don't you go over there. Anybody who tries to tear apart. Listen, I'll tell you what a disassembler is. Alcohol is a disassembler. It breaks up the family. Saved or laws. A disassembler is when you're going to marry somebody who's going to destroy your life. When you bring unsaved people into the church house, 
they may be disassemblers. Especially in this day and age with the sodomites. You may bring the wrong sodomite into your church. And woe be to you. I have hated the congregation of evildoers. They're all around. They're evil, wicked works. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. I will not sit with the wicked. Well, that's kind of hard because Jesus sat with Lazarus. I mean, Lazarus. With, um, wow, I can't remember his name. Judas. And he knew Judas was wicked. What would Jesus do? Not sit with the wicked. That's a constant fellowship with them. You know, Judas wasn't wicked the whole time. At any time, Judas could have said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. And when, Jesus, when, they, when he took the sop and gave it to Judas, that's when the Bible says Satan entered into it. He could have threw that 30 pieces of silver down any time he wanted. You trying to tell me that God made Judas do it? Then, then you violated the free will. What happened after Judas became wicked? Oh, that's when he got up from the table and took off. See the difference? And how many people, Christians today, sit with the wicked? You know how you know how you get rid of the wicked? You know how to do right? If it's lunchtime and all that, you're at the workplace, just sit down with your Bible and a sandwich. You'll find out they won't sit with you. They'll leave themselves. You don't have to do nothing. I will wash my hands in innocent. Now that's not a literal washing of hands. I mean, that's not a sink there. It is. He's saying, listen, my hands, it says in Jeremiah or Ezekiel, I believe it's Ezekiel, that if you don't go warn the people and they die, it says the blood of, of their, their souls is going to be on your fingertips. Now if you warn them and they still don't do what they're supposed to, listen, they're going to be judged, but your hands will be clean. David this has to be before Bathsheba. Because David's hands were in murder. This is talking about, I guarantee, and I don't know, I shouldn't give a guarantee. But David had two opportunities to kill King Saul. And he came out of it clean and righteous and holy than, than King Saul. One time he, he ripped his skirt. And then he, that upset him. Another time he walked into camp, he grabbed the, 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 uh, the spear and the bolster, went off a little bit and cried out woke, and woke them up. I will compass, circle, thine altar, O Lord. David was in the tabernacle, the outside. He was there when he was supposed to be there. At the appointed time and way David was, even when involuntarily, he was there. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. See, I don't... I don't sit with vain persons. I don't go amongst disassemblers. I hate the congregation of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I'll keep my hands in innocence. I'll be at thy altar because those actions will publish thanksgiving and will tell of all thy wondrous works. So what do you say when you don't do those things? You give God a poor testimony. And the world is the world today because the way the churches are today being worldly. 
If we were truly a Thanksgiving nation, we wouldn't do it just one day out of 365. Because the church is not Thanksgiving. Because they would be at the altar that David said. And go to your average church today and born again Christian. I'm not talking about the, the laws. I'm talking about the born again Christian. And see if he shows up for all the services outside of being sick or something happening drastic in his life. And when it comes time for testimony, how quick are people to talk about the Lord and not self? I was in church one time. It was always a testimony time. We always had this one woman. It'd be all about her. It was never the Lord. Finally, the pastor would say, hey, anybody's got a testimony about the Lord and not, by, not of yourself. Thank you very much. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. How much did David love? Lord, you're down there in curtains. I'm over here in cedar. Something wrong with this picture. Lord, when it's cold in Jerusalem, and I'm told it gets cold in Jerusalem, those priests down there are cold down there doing your service. I'm over here warm. Something wrong with this picture. Something very wrong. And the place where thy honor dwelleth. That would be the most holy place. Later on, under Eli, the, the, the front court, the door there, had become a place of prostitution and adultery and fornication of Eli's sons. Even in the holy place, when you get Nahab and Abihu there, they offer strange fire to the Lord. You're gone. Only the high priest could enter that one place once a year, twice. One, he went in for his sins, he came out, then he went in for the sins of the nation of Israel. And that's where God dwells, right between those, those cherubim, the mercy seat. Gather not my soul with sinners. You know how the, how the Pharisees and Sadducees took the, you know, those people down there, you know, if they would know about Mary and she's a sinner, look where, you know, you know. Jesus loved the sinners. So there's got to be a difference here. David is talking about people who sin, open, outright, knowledgeable in sin. Those fat, those Pharisees, those Sadducees and, and Pharisees, you know, anybody who wasn't like them was a sinner. They were judging by their own standards. What do they keep saying about Jesus? Oh, you're with those sinners. You sit down with those sinners. You sit down with those publicans. That's right. Those are the ones that were needed the most. And Jesus would tell them. She, he told the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. Hey, lady, guess what? You don't have one husband. You got five of them. And the one you're with right now ain't your husband. Now that I took care of you, you go down to the priest and you do what you're supposed to do. It's not, it's not, hey, Jesus hanged out with the sinners and, and, and smoked pot with them. No, he told them, said, listen, repent. Now, and don't do it again. Nor my life with bloody men. Uh oh. David, you became a bloody man. That means a murderer. That statement, bloody man, is murderer. David didn't hang out with murderers. Well, but when he got into sin. In whose hands is mischief? Who? The sinners and the bloody men. And their right hand is full of bribes. 
No, their right hand. That's not the right hand of God. Why bribes? I'll give you money if you don't tell anybody. I'll give you money, you know. I know in America today, I know this be a shadow of that. There are there are judges that have judged and will judge, and they take bribes. Hey, if you belong to an organization and you flip them the ring or some kind of special signal, hey, I gotta get you off because we're brothers in this agency and this you know stupid club that goes back to Solomon. That's a bribe. Because you give your organization money and stuff like that. That's a bribe. But as for me, David, I will walk in my integrity. There's that integrity again. Lord, I do what you tell me to do. No Christian can do that. In the Old Testament, you had to do it under fear. Because if I didn't do what God told me to do, I mean, I'd be cut off. You know, God will still dwell in us if we're saved. Even if we just say, hey, we're not going to serve God no more. You'll lose out, but redeem me. Buy me back. And be merciful unto me. We're redeemed once by the blood of the Lamb. The sacrifices would have to would redeem David looking forward to the Messiah coming and having that ultimate sacrifice that we read about in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. And merciful unto me. That's a great thing to ask God to be to you. But you better be merciful to others. Judge not, lest you be judged. For which judgment thou shalt... I mean, get the rest of the verse, but I'll let you find that out. Verse 2 says, you know, what judgment you meet out, what judgment you put, God will return the favor to you. In other words, if you're not merciful, don't expect mercy. If you don't help people out, don't expect help. My foot standeth in an even place. Neither up or down. It's right in the middle. I'm not going to fall down. And it's not going to be a high climb. In the congregations, that's an S, will I bless the Lord. Wherever David goes, there's a meaning. David will bless the Lord. As we conclude this one, Psalms 26. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through out the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bear.